The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. If you're a regular listener to this Equitable Society program, you've probably noticed this about the commercial messages. There's no high-pressure selling. Each Equitable Society message is designed to help you, to give you expert advice on home and family security, to keep you abreast of the latest development in life insurance. For instance, tonight our Equitable Society message deals with a type of insurance most people know little about, yet it's important in the lives of one out of three Americans. So, in 14 minutes, listen carefully for interesting information on group insurance from the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Tonight's FBI file, The Gullible Groom. never been a time in the long history of the nation when there was so much money in circulation as there is at the present time. And when you have that situation, it is axiomatic that you will also have a certain proportion of the population trying to get their hands on some of that money illegally. Some criminals will take a gun and stalk the highways, robbing stores or gas stations or people in parked automobiles. Others will break into homes, steal whatever is available, and convert the loot into money through the use of a fence. But there is one special brand of criminal to whom these days are the days of milk and honey, to whom prosperity presents a personal challenge. He stalks his prey carefully and makes elaborate plans to separate the victim from his wealth. But this criminal does not use force. He uses cunning. He is... The Confidence Man. Tonight's file opens in a football stadium in a small college town. The game is in progress. It is midway in the second quarter. The two teams are lined up on the midfield stripe. The ball is snapped. Both lines lunge, pile up. Suddenly, out of the pack, a player carrying the ball seems streaking down the sideline. Is it the 35? The 30, the 25, the 20, the 15, the 10, the 5. He's over for a touchdown. Jay, huh? what was that? That was a touchdown. Is that good? Oh, honey, how can you be so stupid? It's terrific. Well, Grace, I've never seen a game before. I thought you told me you used to go to games every week back home. Well, I always went with Stella, so I never looked. Not with either head? Huh? Oh, nothing, honey. Just be quiet for a minute. I want to watch this conversion. What's that? They kick for the extra point after touchdown. Oh. There it goes! Did he convert? Yes, sir. Well, what happens now? State college kicks off. And they start all over again? That's right. That's silly. Hey, here comes Walter. Where? Coming down the aisle. To see us? Oh, I guess so. Walter! Walter, over here! Excuse me, please. Excuse me. What? 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry, please. Excuse me. Well, hi, hiya, girls. Hello, Walter. Hi. Well, how are you enjoying the game? Never mind that. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. Who's the man you're with? Oh, well, he's the sucker I'm building up. His name is Herbert Franklin. Has he got money? Oh, oh, loaded with it. Where'd you meet him? Hey, I told you this morning I met him last night at a bar. He thinks I'm an old grad, too. Is that why you're carrying that pennant? Oh, yes, Faye, yes. It's also the reason why I'm wearing this feather, this badge, this school tie, and this horse throat. They're lining up for the kickoff. You'd better go back. Yeah, okay, okay. When do we go to work? I'll be with Franklin in the cocktail lounge at the hotel at 8 o'clock tonight. We'll be there. <laughs> Uh, 
Magnificent voice. The best voice in this whole saloon. Well, Walter, I, I love to sing, but I, I don't get much chance. Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't tell me that. To sing as gloriously as you do, a man has to get plenty of practice. No, no. No, really, Walter. I never get a chance to sing when I'm home. Emma doesn't like noise. Emma? Didn't I show you her picture? Oh, no. Well, wait, wait. Here it is. Here, that, that's Emma and the kid. Oh, hey, fine-looking woman. Yes, she is. And those husky youngsters. Why, why they're going to be football players. I certainly hope so. Oh, pardon me. Yes? Uh, aren't you Herbert Franklin? Why, why yes. Well, don't you remember me? Well, I, I, I remember your face, but I... Oh, we met in New York when you were there last April. My name is Grace Carter. Well, I was in New York last April, but I... Uh, Herbert, know. Herbert, what's wrong with you, man? Where is your old state spirit? Invite the ladies to sit down. Oh, yes. Please pardon me. Will you join us? Oh, surely. Uh, Mr. Franklin, this is my friend, Faye Madison. I'm pleased to meet you, Miss Madison. How do you do? Uh, Miss Carter, Miss Madison, my old chum and classmate, Mr. Robertson. Well, how do you do? How do you do? It's always nice to meet any of Herbert's friends. Uh, sit down, sit down, won't you? Oh, thank you. Hey, waiter, waiter, bottle of wine, please. Oh, well, I just love wine. Do you, Mr. Franklin? Well, uh, yes. Bubbly wine? Yes. In big bottles? Yes. Oh, Mr. Franklin, we have so much in common. Say, <laughs> <laughs> hey, Herbert. Herbert, let's sing the girls our old school song. Huh? Hey, that's a good idea. Oh, yeah. Come on, come on. Everybody sing. Well, you start it. Go ahead. All right. <clears throat> Royal sons of old state, you, you are always right. So, on you go, on down the field. Fight, 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 fight. Who's there? It's me, Walter. Oh. Oh, Walter. Wait a minute, Walter. Good morning, Walter. Good morning. Come on in. Well, how do you feel, Herbert? Awful. Just awful. Well, then you better sit down, Herbert. I... I have some upsetting news for you. What is it? How much do you remember about last night? Not too much. Yeah, I was afraid of that. What do you mean? Herbert, you're in trouble. What kind of trouble? Well, last night when we were celebrating our victory, we, we met two young ladies. I remember that. And you remember that we bought them a couple of bottles of wine downstairs in the lounge. I remember that perfectly. We sang some songs. That's right. Then you insisted on leaving here and going over to Pete's Tavern. I used to go there when I was a student. Yeah, I know, I know. So we went there and we had some more wine. Then about 10.30, you and the girl called Faye got up and said you were going someplace with her and that you'd meet us later. Did you let me go? Oh, sure, sure. You look sober to me. Well, in a couple of hours, Herb, you, you came back. The two of you were giggling like school kids, and you told Grace and me you had gotten married. What? Well, that's what you said. Oh, oh at the time, I just laughed it off. Well, right, it was a joke. Yeah, that's what I thought. But this morning I got to worrying about it, and I checked with the Justice of the Peace you mentioned and the town hall. Well? I'm sorry to tell you this, Herbert, but you really did get married last night. I couldn't have. Oh, believe me, you did. Oh, heavens, Walter. What am I going to do? Well, I've been thinking about that, Herbert. Maybe, maybe there's some way of buying people off. Let me investigate, and, and you wait right here until you hear from me. Meanwhile, in a nearby city in the FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated with his fellow agent Carl Putnam discussing a new case to which they have both been assigned. I'm sorry I had to call you away from the family on a Sunday, Carl, but the boss wanted you to work with me on this. That's all right, Jim. What's it about? Well, I don't know whether you remember a circular some time ago about a trio of swindlers, two women and a man. No, I don't. Who are they? Well, the names are Grace Carter, Faye Madison, and Walter Robertson. I see. What's a swindle? Well, in the past, we've wanted them because Robertson was marrying these girls off to servicemen and then taking their allotment checks. Well, that must have been some time ago, Jim. Yes, it was. That racket stopped with B.J. Day. But then, two months ago, the same trio changed their pattern. Oh? What did they switch to? An old racket. They found a wealthy married man, took him out, got him drunk, and then in the morning they told him that he had married one of the girls. What's their angle? 
Well, the married man naturally can't afford to have that become known, so Robertson acts as a go-between and buys off the girl. And Robertson also acts as if he doesn't know the girl. And somebody actually fell for that swindle? A man named Stewart in New Orleans just two months ago. Well, if it worked, how did we find out about it? Well, after thinking it over, Stewart decided that he'd been clipped, so he came into the New Orleans office. They sent out the circular on it. But you said all this happened two months ago. What's mm-hmm. the rush now? Well, New Orleans got a tip that they hid out down there and just headed up this way last week. Oh, I see. Well, what's the first step, Jim? I've already taken care of it, Carl. The police have been alerted, and they're checking all hotels and rooming houses in the city. Uh, look, while we're waiting for them to call back, why don't you take the records on this trio and study them, huh? Okay. I'll check with you as soon as I hear from the police. <laughs> Where's, uh, where's Faye? Down having breakfast. Well, how do you feel? Awful. Have you seen Franklin? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I just came from their dreamboat, and there's good news tonight. He paid off? Please, tempo. I haven't asked him for any money yet. Why not? I told him I was coming over to see Faye to find out whether I could make a deal for him. Did he remember anything about last night? <laughs> remember anything? <laughs> From the amount of stuff you put in his last drink, it's a wonder he even woke up. I had to do something the way you were going. What do you mean? You got that wine in you and almost killed the whole deal. How? You told Franklin that he shouldn't marry Faye, that he was too good for her. I don't believe you. Look, you got plastered and you pulled the same thing in Pittsburgh, remember? I in Shut Pittsburgh. Up. When are you going back to see that guy? I told him I'd return in a half an hour. How much are you asking him for? Ten thousand. That's too much. But he's loaded with dough. That means nothing. I cased the guy last night. For 10 G's, he'd rather be a bigamist. But, Grace, I... Ask him for five. He'll go for that much. And when you collect, bring the dough right back here to Mama. Carl, I located Robertson and his female accomplices. Good work, Jim. No, not too good. They were at the Central Hotel, but they've checked out. I see. I don't suppose they left any forwarding address. No, none at all. Did you check with the local hotel accounting department? Yes, most of the charges on their bill were from the cocktail lounge. I'm looking for a sucker, I suppose. I don't think so, Carl. I learned that he spent most of his time there with the piano player. An entertainer? Yes, I spoke to him. He told me that Robertson had staked him pretty well to teach him the state university songs. What would he want to know those for? I think I found the answer in this morning's paper. Oh, what is it? There's a story on the sports page about state winning its homecoming game, 7-6. You think Robertson was there? I'm sure he was, and probably as an old grad. We'd better alert the police up there at once. Come in. Hello, Herbert. Hello, Walter. Well, are you feeling any better, old timer? Frankly, no. <laughs> well, I got some news that should cheer you up. It's about your marriage. Oh? Yeah. I've been doing lots of running around trying to fix up things, you know. My first stop was to see the Justice of the Peace, the one who married you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I had to do a big sales job on him, and he finally agreed to do business for $500. What do you mean, business? Well, you know, forget that he ever married you. Oh. Yeah, then, then I went to see the man at the town hall who issued the license, and for another $500, he will forget all about the license. Walter, I'm sorry you went to all that trouble. Ha ha! It's no trouble at all. We're old schoolmates, aren't we? I did it for good old state. I know, and I appreciate it, but... But what? I wish you hadn't done it. Oh, why not? Well, since you told me all about what happened, I've been sitting here thinking. Yeah? Mostly, I was thinking about... Faye. What a... Ah, what a pretty girl she is. Herb, what's your point? Well, I've decided that I want to stay married to her. Uh, you, you what? I want to stay married to Faye. But, but, but you can't. Why not? Well, uh, that, that's obvious, isn't it? Well, what are you talking about? Emma and the kids. You showed me their picture, remember? You'll be arrested for bigamy. But, Walter, they're not my children. They're Emma's children. I just helped to raise them. What about Emma? Well, she'll be mad, I suppose. But she'll get over it. Get over it? Your wife will get over it? Wife? Emma's my sister. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Now, a 50-second interview on group insurance with a man from Boston. 
That... What are you going to name the new baby girl of yours, eh? Mary Ellen Ryan, Mr. Keating, after her mother. But we really ought to name her Equitable Ryan. Equitable Ryan? <laughs> yes, sir. Our company has complete group insurance with the Equitable Society. And my group insurance is going to pay all the bills for Mary Ellen. Hospitals and doctor bills both? That's right. Before we had complete group insurance, my first two kids each put me in debt. But this time... We own our baby, free and clear. Yes, group insurance with the Equitable Society is a mighty good thing for you, Pat. And it's just as good for your company. For three good reasons. First, it means satisfied, loyal workers. Yep. Think of getting life insurance, accident and sickness insurance, and retirement income, plus hospital, surgical, and medical benefits, all in one package from the Equitable Society without any medical examination. Second, group insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society decreases labor turnovers. Mm, right. A fellow thinks twice before he walks out on a job which gives him extra insurance coverage at, for lower cost and he could buy it as an individual. Third, Equitable Society group insurance improves quality and quantity of production. Believe me, I do better work now that I've got rid of worries about sickness and accidents and my wife and kids' future. Pat, I hope every employer in this radio audience hears what you've said and is resolving now to get the facts on complete group insurance protection from the nearest office of the Equitable Society. That's... E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or write direct to the New York Home Office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Gullible Groom. There is no telling with any degree of accuracy how much money confidence men have cost the American people in the past year. But despite the absence of any official records, it is safe to say that the amount runs into millions. And yet, as illustrated by tonight's case from the files of your FBI, there is no reason why these swindlers should be as successful as they are. There is one weapon at your disposal with which they can be stopped. And this goes for any swindler. That weapon and your FBI ask you to use it whenever you're approached with any kind of a proposition by anyone who is at all a stranger to you. That weapon with which every one of you is armed is common sense. The night file continues in a hotel room in the college town. Walter Robertson has just finished explaining his failure to his two female accomplices. So that's what happened. Instead of being his wife, this Emma he kept talking about is his sister. That's just great. Now, look, don't start hopping on me. It's bad enough as it is. Walter. What is it, Faye? I don't understand how he could be married to his sister. That's bigamy. Oh, honey, honey, just keep out of this, will you? What made you think this Emma was his wife? He showed me a picture, said it was Emma and his kids. Walter, if he's not married, he couldn't have kids. I know, Faye, I know. That's bigamy, too. Now, please shut up and let me figure a way out of this. You shut up, too. I'll do the figuring from now on. What am I, stupid? Now that you brought it up? Yes. Uh... You've run this show long enough. It's my turn now. Okay, Mrs. Genius. Now listen to me, both of you. Faith, this Franklin guy wants to stay married to you. Okay, let him have his way. But, Grace, we're not married. How can we stay married if we're not married in the first place? I know you're not married. But go along with the game. He wants to take Faye back to Aurora with him. When? On the train in a half an hour. You can make it. You're all packed. Sure, I'm packed. But don't I have anything to say about this? Who wants to live in Aurora? Faye, you go with him. The whole trip only takes two hours. Walter and I'll be on the same train, and we'll see you in Aurora. <laughs> Jim. Oh, hello, Carl. I've checked the other two hotels. Robertson didn't... Robertson register. stayed here, Carl, but he checked out by the time the police made their call. I see. Any idea where he went? To a town called Aurora. That's about two hours from here. It's also across the state line. Yes, I know. How did you find out they went there? The transportation desk got two tickets for Robertson on the two o'clock train. He's there by now. Should be. I've already alerted the Aurora police to check all the hotels and rooming houses every hour. You think there's anything else to do here before we go to Aurora? Yes, now, look, Robertson must have gone to Aurora to follow a victim. That's logical. It isn't the kind of a town he'd pick to live in. All right, that's point one. Point two is the victim must be an old grad who was back here for the homecoming game. Right. Point three is that the old grad must be married because that's Robertson's pattern. How does knowing all that help us? I'm going over to the alumni office and get a list of the married alumni who live in Aurora. 
I hope you find somebody at the office. It's Sunday, you know. Oh, I've already gotten the alumni association secretary on the phone. He's going to meet me in his office in ten minutes. Good. Now, what do you want me to do? Well, look, Robertson's room hasn't been cleaned since he checked out. The manager will give you a pass key. So, Carl, why don't you go up there and see if you can find him? Okay, where will I meet you? When you're finished, come over to the alumni office. I'll wait for you there. sure this is a place you told Faye to meet us? Certainly, I'm sure. How many cocktail bars do you think there are in this town? I don't know, and I don't care. Oh, Faye. oh there she is. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello, Faye. How was the trip? Oh, it was just fine. We had lunch on the train, and he bought me some magazines with pictures in them and some candy. Oh, never candy. mind that. What kind of a joint does he live in? Well, it looks like one of those castles in fairy tales. I never saw a place so big in my whole life. <laughs> I knew the guy was loaded. He hasn't paid off yet. But you've got a way to make him pay off, remember? That's right. And here it is. You're going to call Herbert in a couple of minutes and tell him we just got into town. Tell him you've got to see him. Why? Tell him you spoke to the Justice of Peace and the guy in the town hall again and that they're going to give the whole story about the marriage and the attempted bribery to the papers. Implicating Herbert in the bribe, too? Right. Then you tell him that they're both waiting for a call from you, and that for 5000 you can chill the beef. Whoa. <laughs> Not bad. Thanks. Faye, he'll undoubtedly talk to you about this. You advise him to pay. Then we come over and pick up the 5000 Grace. What? I don't want to do it. Huh? huh? I, I don't want to do that. Herbert's been very nice to me, and I'd like to stay married to him. Listen, lame brain. You forget you're not married to this guy. He only thinks you are. Oh, that's right. Look, you just go back home and keep Herbert there till he gets our phone call. Alumni Association's office? Carl. Carl, I'm in here. Oh, fine. Any luck yet, Jim? I spoke to the police at Aurora a couple of times since I saw you. What did they say? They've checked every hotel and rooming house twice now, and still no sign of any of the trio. I don't understand that. No. The transportation desk at that hotel said definitely that Robertson bought tickets to Aurora. So they did. You know, he might be staying at the home of the victim. I never thought of that. How about the alumni records? Well, I've come up with 45 alumni who live in Aurora who are married. That's not too many. We ought to be able to comb through them in time to stop Robertson. Carl, I'm afraid we've made a mistake someplace along the line. Why? I phoned the list of the police in Aurora and had them contact every one of the names. And none of them was the right one? None of them had ever even heard of Robertson or the girls. Uh, how do you figure that, Jim? We must have made a mistake. What do we do now? We retrace our steps and see where we went wrong. Well, where do you want to start? Uh, look, before we do that, let's go over your stuff. Now, what did you find in Robertson's room? Well, nothing very much, I'm afraid. This football program, for one thing. Any writing on any of the pages? No, I checked through every inch of space. Okay, what else? This red feather that I suppose Robertson wore in his hat yesterday. No, that's no help. And this banner that he probably waved as he sang the state alma mater. Mm, with tears in his eyes. Yeah. And then in the waste paper basket, there was this ticket stub. I guess that's where he sat for the game. Let me see that, huh? Yeah. There's a red A printed on it. That means it was in the alumni section. And that also means that that ticket was sold to an alumnus through this office. But Robertson's no alumnus. How did he get this kind of a ticket? I don't know, but I think we can find out. Come on. I hope Faye kept Franklin at home. Of course she did. She's not that stupid. Don't underestimate that girl. Well, hello there, Herbert. Oh, hello, Walter. You uh, remember Miss Carter, don't you? Oh, yes, of course. Hello, Miss Carter. Hello, Herbert. Okay, come in, both of you. Well, thanks, thanks. Go ahead, honey. Who's that, Herbert? It's Grace and Walter. Oh, hello there. <laughs> it's been such a long time since I've seen you. Uh, Herbert, I want you to know how awful we feel about this shakedown you're getting. Oh. Thank you. Have uh, <clears throat> have you got the money, Herbert? Yes, yes, I have it right here. Good, good. I certainly appreciate your taking care of this for me. <laughs> Think nothing of it, old man. Are there any other steps I should take? Oh, no, 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 no. I'll handle the whole thing so that no one will know about the marriage until you get ready to announce it yourself. Oh, thank you. Uh, Herbert, I think Faye had better come back to town with us, just uh, so nobody sees her around here and starts to talk. Well, uh, that's probably a good idea. Faye, uh... 
I'm sorry that you have to start your married life off this way. Oh, that's all right, Herbert. This isn't the first... Uh, we'd better be going. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, go ahead, honey. You run along with them. I'll talk to you in the morning. All right, dear. Well, come along, girls. Good night, Herbert. Step back, Robertson. Oh, what? I said step back in there. You and the girls, too. What is this? Yeah. Looks like we arrived here just at the right time. Who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. Are you Mr. Franklin? Yes. Why are you here? To arrest this trio of swindlers. Wait, Faye's not a swindler. She's my wife. Mr. Franklin, that makes you a member of a very large club. However, I seriously doubt that you are married. We can check that, though, when these people are booked in jail. Walter Robertson was tried in federal court and was sentenced to serve five years in prison in violation of the National Stolen Property Act. His two female accomplices were also convicted and sentenced to terms of 18 months. And so your FBI captured three criminals for whom it had been searching a long time and captured them because of one single slim clue. That clue was the stub of the football ticket found in the hotel room. Alumni Association records showed that the ticket had been sold to Herbert Franklin and it was at his home that the arrests were made. Thus, once again, your FBI showed that one way to help curb the crime wave is to follow every clue, however meager it appears, to its conclusion. That is a part of the training given to every special agent before he becomes an accredited member of the agency which serves every one of the 140 million Americans from coast to coast. Your national law enforcement agency, your FBI. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now some more useful facts on Equitable Society Group Insurance. It enables the company to give its employees the benefit of its wholesale purchasing power. It builds loyalty and goodwill, decreases personnel turnover, improves quality and quantity of production. For instance, the president of General Tire and Rubber Company, Mr. William O'Neill, says, We believe that group protection has made our employees happier by freeing them from some of the major worries of life and has thereby helped to improve the morale of our organization. This protection is one of the strongest ties that a man and his family can have with the company that employs him, and it comes to him on such easy terms. If your company does not have group insurance or if your group program is incomplete, get in touch immediately with the nearest office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case in the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case that dramatizes the pursuit of an innocent fugitive by a relentless killer. Its subject, Mob Vengeance. Its title, The Runaway Dancer. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. And Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Runaway Dancer on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.